Right. Okay, hey guys, welcome back to another episode on the Negotio podcast. Uh, as we've mentioned in the previous episode, we're going global, meeting people from all over the world. A quick intro about me. Um, I got inside of the NFT space early in uh, February of 2021. I started with some work in the central land. Now, very recently, I've been uh, getting extremely excited about gaming, uh, video games, and NFTs. Um, I'm running a scholarship program for Axie Infinity and uh, even looking to the future for, towards games like Illuvium and Star Atlas. Uh, but today is not about me, it's about Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea and I have actually never really had a formal conversation, just a few WhatsApp messages here and there. So we're going really unscripted on this episode. And uh, we're going to learn all about what Chelsea does. I do know that she has a big passion for digital nomads and an interest in the crypto space. So, hey, welcome, Chelsea, to the show. Um, how are you doing today? Hey, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, I'm good. I'm uh, just getting back from Vansko in Bulgaria, and I live in Tbilisi, Georgia. So just looking out over the city and kind of waking up, even though it's noon. Lots of flights lately. Amazing. Uh, since when have you been uh, in, in on that side of Europe? Have you been there for a while, or is it like I've been here summer? for a couple of years? Yeah, since awesome. pre since since the pandemic, basically. I would have originally like taken you to 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 Georgia, to Belize in Georgia. Uh, I came here with a friend, and at the time, uh, I was in Spain. And, you know, COVID was sort of heating up over there and Madrid was becoming a hot spot, And that was the next place I wanted to live. Um, so we decided to actually come over here. So do you describe yourself as a digital nomad? You know, it's an interesting question. I'm 38 years old and I've been making money on the internet and working on the internet since I was 14. So this idea of being able to live and work from anywhere has been on my mind for a very long time and has just been a part of who I am and how I grew up. You know, I'm on the tail end of being a millennial. So I'm sort of this in this interesting zone of being a digital native, meaning I grew up half of uh, my childhood without the Internet and cell phones and half of it with. And so I think that puts me in an interesting space where. I don't really think about it as a label, but, you know, lately I've been trying to hang out with and meet more people that are like me because this is, I've realized who I am <laughs> and people that have typical day jobs and want to live in one city forever and ever are probably not as compatible with me as others for friendship and otherwise. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that I I can really sympathize and empathize with you there. I'm, uh, I'm I'm in my you know my home country of Malta, and although I you know I love my community here, and it's it's it, it's always a great time to be to be around my friends on the on the island. Um, it it at the end of a week, the best conversations I have are from behind my laptop, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure, but it does kind of. Um, uh, make me wonder like you know okay now it's i guess it's time for me to get up and go to a place like bansko where i'm actually catching a flight there in just a couple hours um uh, to, to meet people who, like yourself who look at the world i guess a bit differently um yeah so would you consider yourself a digital nomad or are you feel like you're on the brink of it so i can't say i am a digital nomad i do identify as a digital native um, and a person who uh, is, is very comfortable, you know, speaking with people from all over the world. Um, a big part of my work has always somehow related to tourism. And I think that was that that comes from a desire to just meet people who are different to me uh, mm -hmm. and welcome them and kind of tell them about all, all, all about my culture and, and, my, and our way of life. And uh, yeah, I think I am on the brink of it um, in a sense that I, I could technically go and live somewhere where there's a low cost of living, but I would rather, I, I, I'd rather set myself up with a bit more of a financial safety net before I, I did take that leap, which I think should be uh, coming up, you know, in the next few months. Uh, I'm already really looking at, at what to do next. But yeah. 
Chelsea, what what are you actually up to at the moment? What's like your current um, you know focus? Uh, professionally, I work with blockchain technology companies and help them commercialize either in enterprise or in the Web three space. So I have a company with a business partner called Instigation Protocol, which is a boutique agency to do just that. Uh, we work with a number of companies. Sometimes we help launch for IDO. Right now we're launching an NFT collection. Uh, we also, like I said, do like proof of concept and pilots inside of enterprise. Uh, it really depends. We're very flexible and we call ourselves instigators for that reason because we work alongside of teams inside of these organizations to sort of teach them our methodology and thinking, and then also map to their priorities, but extend them as well. And when it comes to uh, your NFT project, I'm, I'm really excited about NFTs over the last, yeah. eight, over the last year. Um, uh, could you maybe share a bit more about what, what it is you're, you're launching? Yeah, yeah. I think hopefully it launches next week. It's called Explorers. It's uh, 10,000... NFTs that are, you know, they're like astronaut 3D-ish uh, art created by some amazing, amazing designers. So they're like astronauts that have over 250 different attributes and they're just really beautiful. They're very inspirational and you can tell they're well done and done by, you know, artists that really, really know what they're doing. Uh, it's just, for me, this is a fun project. Uh, this is like a test to understand sort of the NFT movement and how things are moving and shaping what an NFT launch looks like. And really I've been diving into the technology itself and understanding you know, the contracts and the underlying technology and how they're distributed and minted, et cetera. So I do think it's really important to, to to experiment yeah. and put something out there before you like you know, maybe you have hundred percent confidence in what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that if anyone's interested in NFTs, the first thing that I would do is look at you know Udemy or someplace like that and learn about the technology itself and create your own NFT. It's really not that hard. It'll take you maybe half a day to a day to like really wrap your head around it. And then when you understand the technology, you can develop an intuition about what you can actually do with it, because there's many things you can do with it. I'm sure, you know, you're doing creative things with it and lots of other people are as well. It's, it's basically the way I look at it, a, you know, a certificate of ownership uh, and an extension of our physical and digital worlds connecting and colliding, which I think is happening with everything right now. And I mean, explorers. It 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 does give me you know the the kind of the the adventure, the adventure vibe kind of thing. Like you know, it's you're going out there to chase the frontier. Is there any relation to digital nomads in this theme, or uh, did I mean, I think I think the theme is like it's it's like all things, right? It's like beginning of the internet and exploring the worlds beyond ourselves and trying to understand who we are as humans. You know through the digital and through our devices and through all of the worlds that we're attempting to create and the frontiers that we're, you know, on the, on the brink of and, and exploring really. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a call back to exploring other planets and universes and also a bit of like the Tim Ber Berners-Lee vibe of like, you know, this is like a new frontier of the internet. We're in a new frontier now of, currency and value and art and so many things sort of coming together uh and the, like I said the digital and the physical sort of colliding and I think it's yeah it's a it's a call to a lot of things sure digital nomads are involved with that for sure like it's it's all of that like when it comes to kind of uh, having a mindset of of being an early adopter, it 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 can be that you just love a subject and that's why you're an early adopter. But it could also be it's kind of in your in your character to look out for the the, the latest thing. You mentioned that you've been working online since you were fourteen. How did you start out working online, and how has it changed over the years? Well, that's a great question. Uh... I grew up in a small town in Southern Oregon in the United States. And my parents got the internet specifically. My dad was very like 
we have to get the internet early kind of like attitude. And as soon as I saw and understood the internet, I was immediately hooked and wanted to create on the internet. So I spent, I don't know, you know, a couple of days, but specifically 24 hours, I remember trying to get my first website uploaded, FTP'd onto the internet. And at that time, you know, we were on ISPs and it was a little bit more complicated around web hosting and whatnot. And I created a free stuff and couponing website. Uh, so free products and services, you know, printable coupons, discounts, things of that nature before Groupon or any of that was a thing. And yeah, I mean, what motivated me was people would literally email me and say, wow, this is so cool. Like, thank you for this discount or this content that you posted today. And I felt this sense of global community and connection to people in anywhere in the world. And really that's what motivated me. But eventually I, you know, worked on it all the time. So I lived in a small town in Oregon and there's nothing to do. Uh, and I had a lot of traffic. And so that eventually turned into, you know, learning what was SEO before really SEO was called SEO and affiliate marketing and creating different programs and promotions and partnering with different companies to make money. So that's sort of where I started. Uh, and then I, I saw that you have a bit of wine experience. You had a wine business. Uh, I studied wine and viticulture and wine marketing and international business in college. That's another long story, but we'll pause on that one. And <laughs> <Okay>. then, <laughs> and then I, uh, then I, you know, I got my first job. I worked for a web analytics company before Google analytics was a thing. And it was a visual analytics company. And that sort of rounded out everything that I knew about marketing and had self-taught. Uh, and then I moved to San Francisco and I lived there for 10 years. And during that period, I saw what was happening with, actually I should back up a step. My internet business sort of slowed down a bit because of the Google Panda update. Uh, there was a big rearranging and re-indexing of all websites at that time. And my income got cut in about half. And so I started getting resourceful and looking for ways to save money, make money, connect with people more deeply. Cause I was living in a city and I was used to living in, you know, smaller areas. I lived in a beach town before that, Santa Cruz, California. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I discovered couch surfing and Airbnb and this whole world, this whole movement sort of happening around me. And I've always been someone that sees things far ahead, but the first few times it happened, I just let it go. This time I was like, you know what, I'm gonna really, I'm gonna investigate this. I'm gonna see what this is and understand it. And so through a confluence of events, I ended up being a subject uh, in a couch surfing documentary and traveling with that documentary and, uh, I wrote a book on the sharing economy. I suppose at this point it was, uh, it's called It's a Shareable Life. I suppose at this point I, I was very conscious of what I was doing and very motivated from the sense of this is connecting people. This is a really beautiful way to take a thing and use it as a bridge to connect to another person versus the obfuscation of money again, another subject. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and so, yeah, I, I did a lot of that for a long time and I connected people, you know, all over the world and really teased out the conversation of what is sharing and what is the sharing economy. And eventually there was a lot of capital put into that venture capital specifically. And I felt like it ruined the original community and sort of global uprising happening. So I started looking at financial and social models to finance things from the ground up, which is where I found blockchain, which is how I've sort of been bridging these two worlds. It's very interesting. I will get to blockchain in a second, but you said something that, uh, you know, I, 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 get, I get goosebumps when I hear things that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that have to do with entrepreneurship, foresight. And you said that uh, you spotted some opportunities in your, throughout your life and you didn't take action on them. And then once you realize that, hey, you know, these ideas, these predictions, this foresight I had was actually correct. And I could have, you know, 
kind of capitalized on 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 having the on having a future vision. What were these kind of early ideas, and what, how did this switch come about to to believe in yourself and to believe that yes, my opinion is really valid. My opinion of the future is sometimes correct, and I'm willing to risk mm. my uh, time in the present to uh, have a, a result in the future. Mm. There was a time in the early internet and during the dot com boom and bust where people were like, the internet's dead, you know, it's not going anywhere, this is nothing. Like, you know, it's hard to imagine that now. Uh, and before that, people were interested in the internet, but it wasn't like a thing that wrapped around our daily lives as much. And definitely saw that, also saw how Wi Fi and data and the ability to be and work anywhere was going to happen and result in, you know, sort of this remote workforce and the changing landscape of work and how we think about who we are as humans and where we live and borders and this changes all of us, you know? So I would say I saw that very, very early on. What changed? You know, I went to one specific conference. I wish I could remember the name of it. I should email the conference advisors because our our creators organizers because it it really it really impacted me I don't know if I was just ripe for you know absorbing all of this knowledge or or whatnot but they were one of the things they said is if you have ideas you have to talk like just talk like say what you think say what you feel you know Imagine that anything that you say is on the front of the New York Times, so don't say anything that you don't want repeated, but be vocal. If you're in a room full of people, don't be the person that's just quiet. And especially as a woman, this was pointed out, women don't talk enough. They don't, they're basically cultured in a way where they're taught to be polite and to listen and lots of other things and I decided I think right then and there that I'm gonna be I'm gonna use my voice I'm gonna you know stand up and and be in front of rooms and say what I think and I don't know that I was thinking about it at that time in the way of like I want to capitalize with my ideas it's more of sharing the full expansion of who I am and what I think in my energy and seeing where that leads. That's it. That's it. I, 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 th I think, uh, you know, when I, when I say capitalize on your ideas, it's, it's more uh, in a sense that um, I wish that people who have good ideas use their ideas and live their life by doing what they what they think is 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 the is the way forward, rather than yeah. you know getting a getting. And look, jobs are fine, and I mean there's nothing wrong with getting a job. But I know many people who are unhappy in work, who are very much mm. like me, who have super ideas, but because they don't uh, take action on those ideas, then their their income is not tied to 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 their own you know to their own uh, to their own beliefs and to their own kind of mission it's tied to someone else's which is fine, yeah i mean i'll i will say that like i yeah i think that following your joy and your inspiration and your belief in yourself even when the chips are down and i mean i went broke a couple of times like writing this book doing self-exploration, you know, figuring out who I am and what I am, learning to live in flow. These are not easy things, but I believe that they're actually easier than resisting a life that you don't feel like really truly represents your full embodiment. I get it. I get it. Now, this might be a, a bit of an open question, um, but basically, like I, th I think that uh, when I, when I had first organized an event in Malta, how to become a digital nomad, I wasn't the host of it. I was just the I was the host, not the speaker, uh, back then, and that's what got me into digital nomads. Um, the the topic like of discussion was mostly around like what business models can you set up, 
And everything that was being discussed was like Amazon FBA, affiliate affiliate marketing, um, you know, writing blogs, um, creating content for uh, for uh, for different companies around you know, when you're when you're traveling on the go. Um, but I personally think that uh, blockchain is creating a lot of new business models for for digital nomads. I wonder if you have any insight on, on like to any kind of use cases that people should maybe pay attention to or um, start doing. I mean, already. this is not investment advice, but yes, yeah, <laughs> I think everybody, advice. I think, I think everybody should invest in Bitcoin and Ethereum right now. Like I, I really do. I mean, obviously there's other investments that can be made and there's a lot of altcoins and there's a lot of action happening, but until you really understand the markets and, follow it for a while, I would recommend not doing that. I think that's actually the biggest opportunity right now is thinking about, you know, for, for anybody really, is thinking about what's happening and following, you know, sort of the growth. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of crap out there too. Like there's a lot of stuff that's not, that's either not real or not going to stay, but understanding and following it right now is a huge opportunity because this is going to be a thousand, a million times bigger than it is now. And the people that see that now will benefit later. And, and in the short, and, and I believe even in the next couple of years, they'll benefit handsomely. Uh, you know, I think that there's always been a lot of business opportunities. I don't think that blockchain necessarily creates new business opportunities for digital nomads. I think that it creates a new lens by which to do business and to think about business. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, they exit college or their first job and they become digital nomads. So they do something, you know, simple, like they teach English online or they, you know, do like an affiliate marketing blog or something of that nature. But I think to create long-term sustainable income, you need to create a business, which means that you know, you have a direct set of customers and you're building wealth over time, uh, not just one-off in consulting gigs. So I would recommend that, you know, most people think about like how to build, how to build a business and think about like what you have at home and like what's needed on the road and how to serve, how to serve people that are underserved. That's nice. That's, that's kind of what I'm doing at uh, Nomad Visa Malta. Sorry to plug it in, but yeah. it's, uh, I, 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 and I, I mean, so in Malta, we had uh, for the past eight years, a big discussion about uh, immigration and whether it's right to attract people who, before the Nomad Visa, people who are high net worth individuals and, you know, to kind of give them residency incentives to come here and, and this sort of thing. Um, and, and of course, the Nomad Visa came along um, as well, which whilst it doesn't target high net worth individuals to, to buy property and, and get a residency and then a passport, it's it's just like a kind of a, a gateway to Malta and Schengen. Um, uh, like it's, that was just one way that I could uh, look at my, my, my unique kind of scenario, what's around me. Uh, and in this little island where we're made of rock you know and w w w what service can i provide to people and i think uh, the, the same could apply to to somebody from uh, from tbilisi in georgia they could say you know hey what's what's unique about about my country that you know uh, i'm sorry to use the word again capitalize that i can capitalize on um and I, that's that's a nice way to, to think about it um yeah i mean for example in georgia like one of the things i've thought about here mm -hmm. is that the wine industry here is uh very i would say early um even though the wine is amazing and it's some of the oldest wine if not the oldest wine you know making in the world and it there's a lot of amazing boutique wineries, but they're largely unknown to the rest of the world and not exported. Cool. So, so tell me about your uh, your wine uh, adventures, because actually I, I had a company with a wine subscription club. Yeah, I that, saw that. I saw that. Yeah, I was yeah. looking at that. I'm like, maybe I should start a subscription in uh, Georgia. No, I'm more <laughs> interested right now in just like getting people into Georgian wine and showing that there's more than just the high production wines that they sell in like grocery stores here, which is what happens in the U.S. too, by the way. Uh, 
let's see, you know, I went to a university called Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, which is sandwiched between the mountains and the beach, beautiful place. And it was the very first college in the United States that openly said, we are about entrepreneurship and technology and we're combining them in our business department. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm doing that because my parents were, were very, very like, you have to go to college, Chelsea. And I really didn't want to go to college. I sort of regret going to college, to be honest. Again, another story, but uh, it took me a long time to get through it. But I, I went to Cal Poly and I was very excited. And, you know, the first time I applied, I didn't get in. It was a very impacted program. And I was coming in as a transfer student. And I reapplied under agricultural business because it was a slightly less impacted program, meaning like less applicants um, got in. And my plan was to transfer over into the business department. However, I didn't feel as much resonance with the students in the business department as I did in the agricultural business department. And there was more math, more economics and ag business, surprisingly. And it was just, it was just more interesting, more kind, I guess, hearted, like easygoing people. And then I went wine tasting for the first time, like real wine tasting. And I had uh, a Pinot Noir from different years, uh, same, same vineyard block, same vineyard, uh, same winemaker, different years and taste them side by side so a flight of pinot noir three different years and i was just floored i was like this is amazing this is art and science and business and all the things combined and yeah i just decided right then and there okay like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna study wine marketing and and be done with it it's, it's no different than any other inputs or outputs but uh, I worked in a winery in college and, you know, I, I looked at, you know, working myself into the wine business after that. But it turned out that in most cases, unless you're doing a different kind of model or import export or something, you know, around wine, like actually creating a winery or creating a wine, at least in America, is a very expensive uh, endeavor which most people do once they're already wealthy. <laughs> so I was like, cool, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go do technology for a while. I'll buy a picture <laughs> later. Okay, so uh, that's, that, that would be really, really cool actually to have a, a vineyard in Georgia and see what you could do with it there. Yeah, I've been looking at property actually here. We'll see. Yeah, cool. Um, any kind of thing that, um, you'd like to share with people um, maybe about what you're up to or some advice or what to look at uh, any kind of value yeah I was thinking about what to talk about today and I, I think you know I'm speaking about this at a conference in Montenegro in a couple of weeks or a month and the it's a it's a co-working conference and the topic is that I'm speaking about is co-everything and I think it speaks to sort of the integration and the attempt to meld all of our worlds, like, you know, like I said earlier, our physical and our digital and our professional and our personal uh, co-working, co-living, freelancing, the digital nomad movement, everything from like blockchain to NFTs to virtual reality and, you know, living in, in, in different dimensions and then calling out to them with say, uh, non-fungible tokens and saying like, you know, this thing exists here, but I own it actually also over here. I think that there's a big opportunity in this integration movement that we're seeing right now. Uh, and I think that we're doing it both from a sort of spiritual level on the inside, like interpersonal growth, and then also on the outside of, okay, like maybe we separated everything, but it's actually not so separate after all. Okay, I get it. And if people would like to kind of uh, uh, go to this conference, what's it called? Uh, I'll have to look that up, actually. It's, it's called okay. like the co. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to look that up. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's happening in a month or so. Yeah, it's in, it's in October. October. I'll send you the link, actually. Yeah, I, I might, I might uh, consider popping over there myself. Yeah, please. That would be amazing. Yeah, awesome. there's some really interesting people coming there from the early uh, co-working world and uh, other places, technology as well. Cool, cool. 
And uh, if anyone would like to to follow you or uh, stay up to date with, with what you're up to, where should they find you? Uh, Restroom.com is my last name. If you want to email me directly, I'm also uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the normal places. You can also find me on Telegram. Yeah, basically all right. everywhere. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> super, super. Okay, yeah. Chelsea, Chelsea Rustrum, uh, Rustrum. Um, really nice yeah. chatting with you. I would stay longer, but I need to go catch a flight soon. Um, yeah, nice uh, chatting with you. Next time I want to learn more about you and your wine business and your your whole projects and everything that you're working on. I feel like this is a little too one side. I mean, it wasn't too one-sided, but I, I would love to learn more about you and what you're up to. Thanks. I, I mean, I'd be happy to share everything that, that I'm up to. I, I think I need to find out a way to kind of... Um, uh, show that off a bit better as well but really enjoy talking with you and um, i hope we you know I, I i get to see you in montenegro and we can you know take this conversation on a, a bit a bit further as well yeah let's take it on a journey so nice chatting <laughs> with you have a great trip you thanks ciao, okay ciao. okay bye